All right, welcome back, everybody, to the Parsha Review podcast. This week's Parsha is the special Parsha of Vayera. It is the fourth Parsha in the book of Genesis, in the book of Bereshus, and it is the fourth Parsha, the fourth portion in the Torah. There are 147 verses, 2,085 words, 7,862 letters. And like we mention every week, the reason we specify the numbers is because there's not an extra word, an extra letter, an extra verse in the entire Torah. We're going to see a few examples of that today. We're going to see a few examples of how we learn a verse of the Torah and don't take it just simply, oh, well, it was a sunny day. We'll see there's tremendous wisdom secrets in every single word, in every single letter of the Torah. There are no direct mitzvahs, there's no prohibitions, no performative commandments in this week's Parsha. And the Parsha begins, Vayera Elov Adonai Be'elonei Mamre V'hu Yoshev Pesach O'el K'chom Hayom. And Hashem appeared to Abraham when he was in, in Elonei Mamre at the entrance of his tent at the heat of the day. Three days after performing the bris milah, the covenant between Abraham and God with the circumcision, it's the most painful day, three days after circumcision is the most painful day. Abraham, at the age of 99 at the time, is visited by Hashem. Hashem unleashes a very, very hot sun, more than usual. Why? So that no traveler stopped by Abraham's house. What God didn't want is that God knew that Abraham loved to be kind and loved to welcome guests into his home. And he wanted Abraham to just rest and not care for others, but to rather care for himself. Abraham is sad. Avraham is sad that he has no guests. Hashem sends three angels and Abraham rushes to offer lavish hospitality. So we're going to see these verses in a few minutes. We're going to see how we learn every single detail from the verse. Simple words, just giving us the description of what's going on, is not no simple description. It's telling us great detail into the characteristic of Abraham, to his dedication, to his desire, his never-ending desire to emulate God in every aspect. So then who are these guests? These guests are angels. These angels came for three missions, for three prophecies. Number one, to reveal that in one year, Sarah is going to have a son. Now, again, Sarah at that time is 89 years old, and she laughs. Chodalios la orach kanashim. She doesn't anymore have the women's system of having a baby. She doesn't have the women's um, operating system for nurturing a baby, and that's why she was like laughing, this is impossible. The second angel says that he came to destroy Sodom, Sodom and Gomorrah, because of its wicked people, and the third came to heal Abraham. So there are many lessons we need to learn here. Firstly, that God came to visit Abraham, where there is a special commandment to visit the sick. It's not a commandment in the Torah, but we learn this incredible mitzvah from the Almighty. The Almighty visited the sick. We go out and visit the sick. We see hospitality. We see how Abraham took such great care of his guests. And we'll notice more detail that Abraham tells them, just sit and I'll give you a little bit of water and food. You know, Instead, he goes inside and slaughters three animals. And there's another important lesson we're going to see, and that is that he doesn't bring them into his home. He sits them under the tree. Why? Because they, they were dressed like Arabs. And as Arabs, they're idol worshipers. And as idol worshipers, he doesn't want idolatry in their home. So he gives them water to wash their feet so that all of the idolatry, the sand that they were bowing down on, all of that is cleared off from their feet before he serves them. Abraham now is walking, escorting the angels out after they eat. And we know that they're heading now to Sodom and and Gomorrah, right, to destroy the whole city of Sodom. But Abraham pleads with God to save the city of Sodom if there are 50 righteous people. And he negotiates with God, and God says, if there's 50 righteous, no problem. If there's, there weren't any. If there were 40, 
God says, no problem. If there are 40 righteous, I'll save the city. There isn't any. If there's 30, I'll save the city. If there's 20, 10, now less than 10, God can't go less than 10. That's one of the reasons we know 10 is a proper quorum that's required for a city to be saved and considered righteous. If you have 10 righteous people, the Talmud talks about the Asar Batlanim, that there should be in every city, every Jewish city, 10 people who sit and learn Torah uninterrupted. It's an important charity. It's an important cause for people to invest in, to invest in Torah scholars, to just sit and learn. But there has to be 10. 10 is a, a number which is considered a respectable number that in the merit of 10 people, God is willing to save the city of Sodom. But even 10, there wasn't. The angels save Lot, Abraham's nephew, and his family, and the angels warn them not to look back. Don't look back. You're leaving the city. They got him out. And there's many, many details the Midrash talks about of how exactly the angels came to Lot and how Lot offered his daughters. And they're like, no, we want the angels. We want these people and uh, to cohabitate with them. And the way in which the Sodomites conducted life was so corrupt and so evil, God didn't want this anymore in, in the world. And God turns over the city, the angels, it, it rains sulfur and fire, the entire city burns and gets overturned and the city is gone, it no longer exists, except for Israelis to sell hand cream in the malls from the Dead Sea products. So it is overturned and it disappears forever. Lod's daughters fear that there will be no husbands for them, so they decide to perpetuate the human race through their father. They get their father drunk and they both sleep with their father thinking that there's nobody else alive on planet Earth, and this is it. Uh, the elder daughter has Moab, and the younger has Ammon, and these are two great nations. And then the Torah tells us in this week's Parsha how Abraham and Sarah move to Gerar, where King Avimelech abducts Sarah. Hashem appears to Avimelech in a dream and warns him that he better free Sarah. He does. He sends off Avraham with great gifts. And Avraham davens for his healing. He got very sick. There was a plague that hit Avimelech and his entire kingdom. And all of them got ill. And Abraham davened, Avraham davened that all of them be healed. And uh, they were. And then there's a great celebration. Avra- Hashem remembers his promise to Abraham. Now at this point, Abraham is 100 years old. Sarah is 90 years old. And Yitzchak is born. Sarah looks like she's 20. We'll see this in next week's Torah portion that it says that Sarah was 100 years and 20 years and 7 years. Why? Because when she was 100, she looked like she was 20. When she was 20, she looked like she was 7. In, in each one, in purity, in holiness, in beauty, uh, it says in the Talmud that Sarah was one of the four most beautiful women in the world. So Sarah was incredibly gifted. On the eighth day, Abraham circumcises his son Yitzchak as commanded, and then he makes a feast when Yitzchak is weaned, And there's a big lesson to be learned here about independence, about Yitzchak becoming, by the way, this is the first source in the Torah for a bar mitzvah. That's when Yitzchak was weaned, when he was 13, he was on his own, that's it. He was independent, he was mature, he took responsibility for his own actions. And our Torah teaches us that when a boy turns 13 and when a girl turns 12, that's when they have their own account in heaven for their mitzvahs. Till that point, their sins and their merits are their parents' account. Their mistakes are in their parents. Their good deeds are in their parents. After the age of 12 for a girl and 13 for a boy, that goes to their own account. And when they're 20, that's when they open up the heavenly account for uh, retribution, God forbid, if they do any sins. The next important segment of the parsha talks about the lesson of keeping away bad influences. Sarah tells Abraham to banish Hagar and Yishmael because she sees signs of degeneracy. She sees that Yishmael is a no-good Nick. We don't need him here. We don't want him here. We don't want the influence of Yishmael to impact Isaac, our son. Abraham is distressed, but Hashem tells him, listen to her voice. It doesn't say listen to what she's saying. Listen to her voice. And this is, a, I think, an important lesson for marriage. It's not the words. It's the voice. 
It's not the words. She said I can go, so I went with my friends. Yeah, you didn't listen to her voice. You listened to her words. Uh, and it's important, very important for every single man who wants to be happily married to listen to his wife's voice. The voice says a lot. She says, sure, go ahead. That's a threat. That's not an approval. Avram is distressed and Hashem tells him to listen to Sarah's voice. After nearly dying of thirst in the desert, Yishmael is saved by an angel and Hashem promises that he will be the progenitor of a great and mighty nation. Avimelech enters into an alliance with Avraham, and this is the same King Avimelech that earlier abducted Sarah, and he sees that Hashem is with Abraham, and he says, I just want to have peace with you. Let's not fight. Let's make a treaty. And then we have the marvelous teaching in this week's parsha, the end of this week's parsha of the binding of Isaac. In the 10th and final most difficult test, Hashem instructs Avraham to sacrifice Isaac at age 37. In the early morning, Avram takes Yitzchak, he saddles his donkey and goes to Mount Moriah. There's a lot of emphasis here on early morning because Avram institutes the morning prayer. We will see more about this soon. At the last moment, Hashem via an angel stops Avraham and sacrifices a ram instead. The horn is saved for later. This is the horn of the shofar of Mashiach. And that's why every Rosh Hashanah we blow the shofar from the horn, horn of a ram. Because of Avraham's unquestioning obedience, Hashem promises him that even if the Jewish people sin, they will never be completely dominated by their foes and the Jewish people will always keep a friendship and a covenant with God that even when we're in total despair, when it looks like there's total annihilation, the Jewish people will always be speared in the last moment. The Torah portion concludes with the genealogy of Abraham, Sarah, and the daughter of Abraham's nephew, Besuel, Rivka, who is soon to be the wife of Isaac, is born. And if you notice, always the Parsha ends with the future being born, with the new redemption coming. We started voracious. We have a terrible generation being born, a terrible generation acting in a terrible way that God is going to annihilate all of them with the flood. But the portion of voracious ends with the birth of Noah. And Noah was righteous and found favor in the eyes of Hashem. We see the portion of Noah, terrible things happen. And the you have the Tower of Babel as well. But it's the, the portion of Noah ends with the birth of Abraham and so on and so forth. You, you see the constant, the, the, the blending of the portions, how it always ends on a positive note, a positive note of hope. So some important lessons that we need to point out here on this week's parsha. Number one is life's mission for every single Jew should be to emulate Hashem, to emulate God. And we see this through visiting the sick. Hashem visits the sick. There's another thing which is gemilus chasadim, which is act of loving kindness, where we see Abraham was the most incredible host, where he's going out of his way to take care of every need of his guests. There's also an interesting note, if you notice, there's a specific emphasis that Abraham offers his guest, Chema v'chalav, in verse number 8. He offers them cream and milk. And then immediately after that, he gives them the calf and all of the meat because we know that the halacha tells us you can eat milk before meat, but not meat before milk. And here we see how Avram, who learned the Torah, knew the proper way. And he gives them the milk first and then they can eat the meat. But also we see there's something, Vayita Eshel, he planted an orchard. Eshel, our, our sages teach us, is the three components of hospitality. Achila, which is giving someone to eat. Shtia, which is giving someone to drink. And the last is Levia, escorting them out, or Lina, giving them a place to sleep, but also escorting them out. And we see that Abraham escorted his guests out. Our sages tell us to be very, very careful of the, the latter, of those three. And that is escorting your guests out. Why? 
Because if you don't escort them out, instead of having Eshel, Aleph, Shin, Lamed, which is an orchard, which is so beautiful, a beautiful, perfect mitzvah, it becomes Esh. Because you left out the Lamed, it becomes Esh. And God forbid, many of our sages tell us, it can be a negative omen of bringing fire into your home. So my rabbi, may he live and be well, asked, what does that mean? You're going out of your way. You're inviting guests to your home. You're giving them food. You're giving. You're whining and dining them, but you didn't escort them out, and you get a punishment for that. What's going on here? How do we understand this? See, so he says, no. It doesn't mean that fire is going to come to your house. He says, what it means is, ash means fire, red embarrassment. He says, someone comes to your house, they feel like I need to come on to someone else for food and to, for drink. But when you escort them out, when you escort those guests out, they get the feeling, no, they loved my presence here so much that they even wanted to spend the extra few seconds walking me out. It softens the entire embarrassment that they might have, that I needed to come on to someone else for food and drink. Look, they loved that I was here. They loved that I was present in their home. They loved my company that they even wanted to walk me out. It softens their embarrassment and makes it into a beautiful orchard where they feel loved, where they feel that the mitzvah was complete. It wasn't just, here, take food and take take something to drink, but rather it is a, a, a mitzvah that someone with passion and with love has opened their home for us because they want us there. I think it's such a beautiful perspective, such a beautiful understanding of the mitzvah of Hachnasas Archim, welcoming guests into our home. It's not only giving them something to eat and drink. It's their entire experience should be a pleasant one and to think of everything that they need. There's a story told about the Chavetz Chaim when he was in his 90s. Someone came to stay at his house and the Chavetz Chaim was preparing the bed, the bed sheet for the guest. And the guest's like, no, the Chavetz Chaim, you don't need to... Uh, you don't need to prepare my bed for me. I can do this myself. It's fine. I don't want you to... He says, you, you want to take away my mitzvah of being like Abraham, of hosting a guest in my home? This is my mitzvah. For you, it wouldn't be a mitzvah. For me, it's a mitzvah. It's such a privilege to be like the disciples of Abraham. Another important, very important lesson for us to learn is that God there is sitting... At the entrance of the tent with Abraham, God is visiting him, so to speak. Here is a sick man. Three days after his circumcision, God comes and visits him. And they're sitting and schmoozing. And then Abraham sees, "Ah, ah, look, there are three guests. God, hold on a second. Time out. Time out. I got to run take care of these guests. And we see that God indeed teaches us this idea that take care of your fellow man before you take care of God. That's what God wants us to do. So if someone has the opportunity to daven and at that moment there's a great mitzvah that comes your way, do the mitzvah with your fellow man, God says, I'll wait. I'll wait because I want to see you emulate my ways. Emulate the ways of Hashem where we take care of our fellow man, where we take care of another human being just like God would. God says, I'm going to wait. And then when Abraham returns, God is waiting there because he did the right thing. Ben Adam Lechavero, the proper way of conduct between man and his fellow, always precedes the conduct of Ben Adam Lamakom, of the way one conducts himself before the Almighty. The next important lesson is to distance from idolatry in cleaning their feet. Abraham makes a special emphasis here is water to wash your feet. He doesn't tell them why. Just wash your feet. You have sand on your feet. But our sages teach us, and Rashi emphasizes this, that Abraham didn't want idolatry near his house. And therefore, any remnant of it should be completely removed. Our sages teach us that we always, and we see this later with Yishmael, we need to remove negative influences from our lives. If there is a a, an influence, and this, by the way, goes down to a very practical level of even a cell phone. If you have an app which is taking much of your time or is a negative influence, get rid of it. No one is forcing us to have an app which is a negative influence on our phones. It's our choice, and it's our choice to put it there. It's our choice to get rid of it. 
If there is a negative influence, even, I'll share with you a private story. When we lived in Brooklyn, New York, my family lived there from 1981 till 1988. We lived in Brooklyn, New York. And one day, my brother and I got into a little bit of a fight, as brothers do, loving brothers. And uh, I used a word that probably should never be used by a nice Jewish boy, especially not a nice Jewish boy learning in a yeshiva. And my mother was shocked that I would even talk like that. And my mother's like, you, you just wait till your daddy gets home. My father comes home, and instead of reprimanding me and, and giving me a potch or whatever, my father very lovingly sat with me on the front porch, and he says to me, I'm not upset that you said what you said. You know that you should never use such words. He says, I just want to know where did you learn that from? And I pointed right across the street. We lived right across the street from one of the public schools in New York City, and it was, I mean, I used to play with the many, many non-Jews from all different backgrounds, you know, Puerto Ricans and Italians and African Americans and you name it, and that's the way they would talk. And my father said, I'm not upset at you. It's my fault because I put you in a place where you have such influences. And a few weeks later, my parents were in Muncie for Shabbos with us to look for a new home, and we moved to Muncie because of that. Because in Muncie, you don't have public schools. You don't have those same influences that your kids could be influenced from. And I think it's a very important lesson for us as parents to constantly monitor the influence of our children. And if the influence is not a good one, don't blame your children. You're putting your child in a situation which is going to influence them. You're putting them into an environment where they're going to be influenced. And if it's not a good influence, move them out of that situation. So on a very direct, personal level to each and every one of us to take note, if there's something which is a negative influence in your life, make it your point to remove it or to remove yourself from it. Hashem controls all of creation, all of nature. Hashem brings out a very steamy, hot, hot, hot sun. And as the verse says in chapter 18, verse number one, the first verse in this week's Parsha, we said there's no extra verse, there's no extra word, there's no extra letter. It says two words, kichom hayom, in the heat of the day. And our sages say, what does that mean? Why is there an emphasis about that? Rashi says, hotzi HaKadosh Baruch Hu chamo min artiko shalo lahatricho ba'orchim. God took out the sun from its case, in its protective seal, and made it extremely hot just so that Abraham will not be busy welcoming guests into his home. And because God saw that Abraham was so upset, that he didn't have guests, Boim coming to him, God brought angels in the form of humans so that Abraham can have the privilege of doing the mitzvah of welcoming guests into his home. All this we learn from two words, kechom hayom, at the heat of the day. Such an important lesson for us to see that there's not an extra word. God is in control of everything. Another perfect example in this week's parasha is Sarah's inability to have children. She doesn't have a womb. We mentioned this last week. She doesn't have the wherewithal to produce a child. When she laughs, God asks, chapter 18, verse 14, Is there anything beyond the capability of Hashem? Anything? At this point of time, at this appointed time, I will return, meaning next year, I will return to you and Sarah will have a son. And this demonstrates to us that even though there are things that seem to us impossible, it will never happen. It's against the laws of nature. Well, God controls nature. And just like he created the laws of nature a certain way, he can change the laws of nature in whatever way he wishes. So we have to understand and remember, the sun that God made extremely hot, hotter than normal, was a change of nature, 
And the womb of Sarah being able to carry a baby at the age of 90 was God showing us his control over all of nature. Another very important lesson to talk about is prayer, the power of prayer. Always ask Hashem for everything. I've had people say, well, God doesn't care about my son's little league game. Yes, he does. Because it's something in your life God wants to communicate. God wants to have the relationship between him and his creations. Not only that, that you can ask for everything, but you can negotiate just like Avraham did. Abraham negotiated with God for 50, for 40, for 30, for 20, for 10 righteous in the city of Sodom, and God would save them. You can negotiate. Abraham instituted the prayer of Shachras, the morning prayer. He says he got, a Avram Baboker. he got up in the morning to pray to God. And that's one of the sources for the morning prayer being instituted by Abraham. Abraham founded the morning prayer, Isaac the afternoon, and Jacob, the evening prayer. Another thing that we see is that Abraham prayed for someone else. He prayed for Avimelech. Our sages teach us that when you pray for someone else, you will benefit first. If you know someone else, there's actually an organization in New York that matches up people who have the same issue, whatever the issue is, two people who are looking for a job, Pray for each other because the Talmud says when you pray for someone else, you will benefit first. So if you're looking for a job, someone else is looking for a job, pray for them. You will benefit by finding the job first. And they peer people up to pray for each other so that you merit from what our sages tell us. And the idea is not so that you're being selfish. The Talmud says you can go ahead and try to be selfish. When you pray for someone else with your whole heart, that's what Hashem wants. Be selfless. Even if in the back of your mind you have, an, you have an intention that you will benefit first, it's not easy. Try it. Try to pray wholeheartedly for someone else for something that you really want. And you'll see that it brings about a whole new level of love, care, concern, and affection for another human being. Another incredible teaching is how Yishmael is sent, sent away with Hagar, his mother. They're sent away. Abraham is concerned, what do I do? Hashem says, listen to Sarah's voice, and they're sent away. And Ishmael, the Torah tells us, became very, very ill. He was deathly ill. He was thirsty in the desert, and he was going to die. And the angels came before God and said, this is an opportunity. Get rid of Ishmael. He's going to be a wild maniac. He's going to be a beast. Just get rid of him. God says, how is he? At this moment, at this moment, Ba'asher Hu Sham, and the angels say, at this moment, he is at a repenting state. Right now, he was remorseful. Right now, he was dignified and proper before Hashem. God says, if that's the case, we're going to save him. And immediately there was a well there, and he was healed from his illness. There's an incredible lesson. Many people assume incorrectly, comes the time for Rosh Hashanah, comes the time Yom Kippur, how can I talk to God and say, I, I'm just going to go right back to eating the, 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 you know, the stuff that I shouldn't be eating. I, I'll keep on doing the things I shouldn't be doing. I, I keep on going to the places I shouldn't be going. I'm being two-faced. I'm being disingenuous by asking for forgiveness for something I'm just going to resort right back to. God says on Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, Ba'asher Hu Sham, how are you at that moment? At that moment, God looks. He doesn't look at what you did in the past. He doesn't look at what you're going to do in the future. God looks at you at the moment. And therefore, never ever push away from a moment of truth, from a moment of sincerity, from a moment of genuine remorse. If someone feels something, you have a moment of truth, maximize it, utilize it, ask for forgiveness, because God looks at us at the sincerity we have at that moment. The last piece here is the tests that Abraham had. Abraham had 10 tests. Hashem knows you better than you know you. Hashem is your manufacturer. Hashem created you. 
Hashem does not give us a test that we are not capable of excelling at. The 10 tests that Abraham got were unique for Abraham. They're not for us, right? You're not going to get the test of being thrown into a burning furnace by King Nimrod. That was Abraham. Abraham was a unique individual and was given tests that only he can excel at. The 10 tests were, number one, this according to Rashi, Avraham hid underground for 13 years from King Nimrod who wanted to kill him because the astrologers saw that someone's going to be born soon and he's going to identify a monotheistic God and he's going to reveal that to the world and he's going to teach monotheism to the world and Nimrod was convinced that he himself was God. He didn't want a competition. So he was looking for this little Abraham that was going to be born. So he was hidden in a cave for 13 years. Nimrod threw Abraham when he did find him. He Finally, he threw him into a burning furnace and they looked into the furnace and they see Abraham walking around like it's just a regular spring day. Avram is commanded to leave his family and his homeland. That was a test to where? To the land that I will show you. He didn't even know his destination. Imagine, imagine someone says, pack your bags, you're leaving. That's it, you're leaving your home. You're leaving Houston, you're leaving Des Moines, you're leaving wherever you're, you're from. Where to? I want to know how to pack. Well, in the place that I'll show you. Right? That takes a lot of trust. Reliance on the person who is, or the being, the almighty God, creator of heaven and earth, that he's got the right intentions for us. He's going to take care of us. Upon arrival, a famine hits the land of Canaan, and Abraham is forced to leave. Then we learn about Avimelech abducting Sarah. Then we have the king's capture Lot. Avram is forced into war to rescue him. The odds were against him. Avram is told by Hashem that his offspring will suffer under four monarchies. And then at an advanced age, Avram is commanded to circumcise himself and his son. And if you remember from last week's portion, he does so immediately. And then Avram is commanded to drive away Hagar and Yishmael. And the last of his 10 tests was that Avram was commanded to sacrifice Yitzchak at the Akedah, the binding of Isaac. And these 10 tests, these 10 trials, firmed the relationship of Avram as being the leader of the Jewish people, the leader of the nation that was going to receive the Torah. And that, my dear friends, concludes the Parsha Review. My dear friends, those of you out there listening on podcast, you're welcome to write to me at awolbe at torchweb.org, A-W-O-L-B-E at torchweb.org. I look forward to hearing your feedback. If you enjoy the class, what you enjoy. If you don't enjoy, what you don't enjoy. And if you have any questions, you're always welcome to reach out as well. I look forward to hearing from you. Have a fabulous Shabbos.